Welcome to Synthesis Workshop for another Research Spotlight episode. I'm Caesar, a member of the Synthesis Workshop editorial board, and today I'm hosting Julian Gotts. Julian received his bachelor and master's degrees in chemistry from the University of Würzburg, where he did research in the Werthner Group. He also performed research as a visiting student at UC Berkeley in the Fisher Group before pursuing his doctoral studies at ETH Zurich in the Baudet Group with the focus on automation and machine learning for organic synthesis and drug discovery. Julian, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation to speak on the Synthesis Workshop. And today I will be introducing our recent publication, High Throughput Synthesis Provides Data for Predicting Molecular Properties and Reaction Success. When we look at existing drugs, one scaffold that keeps popping up is saturated anhydrocycles. The scaffold provides some very useful properties to molecules in the context of drug discovery. However, as you can already see in these few examples, the diversity of how we attach these saturated and natural cycles is quite limited due to limitations in, in the chemistry to access this scaffold. And someone did the analysis on this, and as you can see, it's really imbalanced. Of course, because it's much easier to substitute on a nitrogen than it is on a carbon. So with slab chemistry, one of the initial aims was to be able to achieve different substitution patterns on saturated and heterocycles. In this work in particular, we will be focusing on morpholins and piperacins. To achieve the substitution pattern that you see here, we make two disconnects. The first one, splitting the molecule into an aldehyde and what we call the slab reagent. And the second disconnect, splitting the slab reagent into another aldehyde or ketone and a redox active ester. So let's change direction and go in the, in the forward sequence. Here we start from an aldehyde or ketone and we form the sulfinamine which is then in the next step, but without purification, reacted with a bifunctional reagent. Here I always draw the redox active ester. We also have a tin-based version. Both have in common that they have this tin or redox active ester group that can form a radical and that undergoes radical addition with the imine to reveal another sulfinamide. The sulfinamide is then cleaved using TFA, uh, very simple. This also works on only SCX2, which is a cation exchange solvent, but for more reliability in the parallel synthesis, we use TFA. This reveals the slap reagent that can then be reacted with another aldehyde to first form the amine using molecular sieves to remove water in the process. And this imine can then in the key step undergo a further redox cyclization with the radical revealed by the TMS group to form the final saturated anhydrocycle. Now having this method in batch is nice, but its power really shows when you execute it in parallel because aldehydes and ketones are readily available. You can buy thousands of them. And if you have a quick way to combine two of them, you can access a very vast space very quickly. So we ported this methodology to 96 wall plates and the steps will be exactly the same but now we use eight different aldehydes and ketones over the eight different rows of the plate to form eight different slab reagents. And to this we add 12 different aldehydes over the columns so that after imine formation and photocyclization we get 96 different saturated and heterocycles in one single plate. And I can already foreshadow, we will go on to evaluate this by LCMS to determine the reaction outcome and we're also going to go on to purify 
these compounds, but I first want to go a bit more into the challenges of this parallelization. So one of the challenges encountered in the first steps is just adding solids. We use cesium carbonate in the sulfinimin formation, we use zinc nanopowder in the radical addition, and to dose them we have used these custom-made plates where we can just fill up the entire plate with the solid we want to dispense and we know how much goes into these wells and then we slide out this sliding bottom and the contents of the solid addition plate just drop into the well. Uh, it's a very simple but elegant way to add solids to a 96 well plate. You also need to be able to remove the solids because of course you don't want to carry over your cesium carbonate base into the other steps. So to remove solids you can just use spin filtration, meaning you have a filter plate that your suspension is in, you have a receiving plate below that, you put it in a centrifuge, the solution goes through the filter plate and you can collect it from the receiving plate. We have used this system of solid additions and solid removal for purifications as well. So what has worked for us there is SCX2, which is a cation exchange solvent. We can add this to the slab reagent solutions. At acidic pH, the slab reagents, because they are amines, will stay on the SCX solvent, whereas everything that's not cationic at this pH will be washed away in the spin filtration step. And only when we add a base, the slab reagents will be released from the resin. We now collect it in the receiving plate and remove the base by evaporation and have the pure slab reagents. The parallelization challenges don't end here. A very significant one is getting photoreactions to run in parallel. Uh, it's notoriously difficult to not have edge effects in your plate, meaning the irradiation has to be uniform across all wells and it's very typical that at the edge of the plate you have less irradiation and thus a different conversion than in the middle of your plate. We had initially tried with a commercial solution but the results were not satisfying so we built our own uh, photoreactor and this has an individual LED for each well and the total assembly of these almost 100 LEDs comes in at about 100 watts of power. So we added a heat sink on the bottom and some fans to flow air over to dissipate the energy from this and then there is also another cooling block that wraps around the individual vials and that is water cooled and you can imagine that we did not come up with these cooling solutions from the very start but we kept adding them on until the temperature was stable and so now you can see the final assembly running here and now the, the cooling is sufficient and still if we put it on a stir plate we can stir through small stir bars in all of the individual wells. Now it remains to answer how uniform is the irradiation of our photoreactor and for that we used a model reaction using uh, quite simple substrates and we conducted it 96 times over one entire plate and you can see the results here and the yield is very uniform. There are these four wells where it's diverging a bit, but we can say that we do not have an edge effect and we are happy with this photoreactor. At this point, we were now able to do a lot of reactions, but we also want to learn something about them. And so we turned to LCMS to get a qualitative understanding of the yield of these reactions. And here is a sample chromatogram of one mixture. Uh, there is the product peak and there is also the other peak you see is from internal standard that we added and we did this for all of the wells and in total i think we took about 1100 something lcms's and we aggregated the outcome of this in this heat map 
So for different combinations of slab reagents and aldehydes, you can see how well this works here. Uh, all of everything that's white, uh, we did not attempt this combination. We will use this LCMS data for machine learning in a bit, but I first want to turn to the purifications. Now, how do you purify several hundred reaction mixtures? We are grateful that our collaborators at Novartis had an answer to this because they have this remarkable system called microcycle. And what this does in, in brief is it uses LCMS to scout the crude mixtures. And from this scouting run, it identifies whether it's worth attempting a purification at all. And it identifies what gradient to use in the purification on PrEP HPLC. It then proceeds with the PrEP HPLC purification and the resulting fractions are evaporated and redissolved in DMSO to have stock solutions of the pure compounds. And after the purification, they went on to do some automated physicochemical assays to determine the solubility, the log D, and the pKa of the compounds. In total, they isolated 488 compounds with this method and all of them we have properties and we also have yield data of both the crude and the purified products using LCMS, using CUT, judged aerosol detection, and QNMR for some of the compounds. We have used the CUT data to corroborate our LCMS based results that we obtained earlier and we see that it's generally in good agreement. As I already said, Novartis has run automated property assays. So we don't just have our purified compounds, but we also have property data on them. And here it's broken down a bit by the central scaffold. And one of the things that we were surprised to see is how much better specific scaffolds are than others in, in a context of drug discovery. So the lowest lipophilicities and highest aqueous solubilities, which are desirable properties, are obtained by either the morpholins that originate from ketones, so that have this spirocarbon alpha to nitrogen, or the piperacins that have an alkyl chain on one side. These are the two that you see high up there. And since the properties seem to be so dependent on the, the compound nature, we went on also in collaboration with Novartis to use one of their models to predict the properties for a virtual library of compounds. We have also used the yield data obtained earlier by LCMS to predict reaction outcome for future combinations of slab reagents and aldehydes. Here we need to distinguish three different cases that have a different difficulty because you may be interested in doing a reaction with a slab reagent that already exists and an aldehyde that we have already used but we have not done this reaction. That's a very simple prediction and to reflect that we also use a simple test set that we call the zero D test set in training the machine learning classifier. Now you can go further and you can, for example, say I want to use a known slab reagent and an unknown aldehyde that I order new and then this would be reflected by the 1D test set. Or you could say, I want an entirely new slab reagent, I want an entirely new aldehyde. And if we want to see how good a model is at predicting the outcome of that reaction, we need to use the 2D test set that reflects that challenge. So 
we trained classifiers for all of these different tasks and on the 0D task the classifiers have a very high performance but we see that that we don't actually need to add chemical information to them even on one hot encoding of the reactants which does not contain any chemical information about the reactants the model achieves the best score this changes once we go to the 1D and 2D problem where we have not seen this specific aldehyde or slab reagent before. And for both of them, the, the chemistry and form classifiers are now performing better than the feedforward network. I will not go further into the details of the machine learning results. They are discussed in more detail in the paper, but since this is the synthesis workshop, I only want to show the final result of this, which is for the serity problem, we can predict the outcome of a reaction of 83% accuracy for the 1D problem of 77% accuracy. So both of these were quite good. For the 2D problem, we can predict with 65% accuracy, which is still better in chance, but not a huge improvement over chance. How do you use all of this? To make this easy, we have prepared a 17 million compound virtual library accessible from Slab Chemistry. All of the library members originate from aldehyde and ketone building blocks that are available from Enamin. And they are all annotated with the predictions of physical chemical properties from the Novartis model, as well as the predictions of reaction outcome from the model I just showed you. To make it easy for you to use, we have put this into just compressed files so you can use the virtual library. Just download it. You don't need to install any program. You don't need to understand anything about machine learning to be able to use the predictions. And you can use them to decide in a rational fashion what you would prioritize making from the slab products. With this, I'd like to conclude and thank all of the people involved in this project. My advisor, Jeff, who lets us pursue these ambitious projects. Then Moritz, who started this project four or maybe five years ago now. And Moritz and Ice did all of the synthetic work that I have shown you today. And then several people at Novartis were involved with purifying the compounds, with running the property assays and of predicting the properties. And finally, I'd like to thank the entire group and you for listening to the synthesis workshop today. Thank you, Julian, for presenting your research. If you enjoyed this episode, please share this video, follow us on Twitter and tune in for the next episode.